This lesson is on inverse trig functions. Some parts of this material can be a little confusing at first, but hopefully we can try and make it clear, and once you begin to practice and think about it, you'll begin to understand it. Let me first go back and review something we've actually already done, and that's solving trig equations. Hopefully when I do this, this will seem very simple because we've already covered this. Say, for instance, you were given the equation cosine of theta equals square root of 2 over 2, and you're asked to solve this for theta. So once again, trying to solve an equation, trying to find the value for theta. Of course, this is going to be an angle. Trying to find the angle that when you take the cosine, it's square root of 2 over 2. And let's just say for now, we'll just limit our answers to 0 to 2 pi, or one trip around the unit circle. So you think of the unit circle. And you ask yourself, for what angles is the cosine square root of 2 over 2? And then you realize right here, pi over 4. And then these are both negative, so when you get to quadrant 4, you're at 7 pi over 4. So, it's actually two solutions. They go pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4. And let's just do a sine. How about we were asked to solve the equation sine of theta equals one half. Once again, we're looking for an angle or even more than one angle. We'll limit ourselves to zero to two pi. So you ask yourself, okay, let's go find an angle or angles where the sine is negative one half. And if I go back up here, that occurs actually over here at 5 pi over 6 and over here at 7 pi over 6. So this is basically just a function of remembering and understanding the unit circle. Now we're going to do something a little different. Let's go ahead and take this sign And we're going to try and solve this again, except the difference is we're going to use a different method, and we're going to use an inverse trig function. So an inverse trig function, one of the things they're used for is to try and solve an equation like this, but there's going to be a certain kind of limitation that we have. Now before we do that, let me take a, just a brief detour and just talk about a principle in math that you've used before and I want to remind you of it because we're going to use the same principle when we start explaining how inverse trig functions work. Think back to where maybe you had if you were asked to solve this equation square root of x equals 3. It's almost like our goal is we want to sort of get x by itself, or sometimes they say to isolate x. But as of right now, it's like the x is stuck under the square root. So it's like, well, we have to think of a way to get rid of or to negate this square root. And I'm sure all of you know that what you do is when you square a square root, it's sort of like they cancel out or they reverse each other. Of course, if I square the left-hand side, I have to square the right-hand side. So when I do this, 
<clears throat> this gives me a way to solve that equation. <clears throat> so the whole key was finding a way to reverse or cancel out the square root. One more quick example, sort of similar. How about if I had x minus 1 quantity squared equals 16. I was trying to solve this equation. So here, it's almost like the x is inside the parentheses and it gets squared. I guess you could maybe foil this out, but I don't want to do that. There's an easier way to do it. So when you have something squared, I really want to get rid of this exponent, the square. And I'm sure you all remember that in this case, if you take the square root of something squared, those cancel out or negate or reverse each other. Of course, I have to do the same thing to both sides. So in this case, I'd have x minus 1 equals if you take square of a number, you have to have both the positive and the negative. So really, my solution is x equals 1 plus or minus 4. So for this problem, there are actually two solutions. But the key is, I want you to realize that I started out having this parenthesis squared and the way I negated or canceled it was to take the square root. Well, that's sort of the idea now that we're going to use for these inverse trig functions. The problem we started a minute ago was the sine of theta equals negative one half We want to solve for theta. First of all, there are two ways to write. In this case, I'm going to do the inverse sine function. It's written two ways. You write the sine, but then you stick like a negative 1 up here. It looks like an exponent. It's not an exponent. This doesn't mean sine to the negative first power. This is just a way to write inverse trig functions. It's just notation. It has nothing to do with an exponent of minus 1. And maybe because some students get confused by this, there's a second way. They write inverse trig functions, and it's this word arc arc sine. So those are inverse sine functions. Of course, we have the other trig function, so we can have inverse cosine, or you might see arc cosine, or inverse tangent, or arc tangent. All right, so now finally, I keep starting to solve this equation, and I keep getting distracted. So now here we are. What an inverse trig function can do, or in this case an inverse sine function, an inverse sine function is like the opposite of the sine function. It's almost like squaring a square root. They sort of negate each other. So what I'm going to do is, to solve this equation, I really want to get theta by itself. And like right now, it's stuck sort of inside the trig function. You know, theta is an angle. I want to get it by itself. I can do that if I take the inverse sine. Because the inverse sine of the sine those things sort of cancel out, and now you're just left with theta, the thing we're trying to solve for. So in a sense, this is almost like a mathematical algebra way to solve for this angle theta. When we did this before, right here, 
we just sort of in our heads did what we know common sense says to do. We were able to, I guess up here, we were able to just think about it and realize that the answer solution has to be 5 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6. Well, here, we're sort of doing it more like an algebra, like actually solving an equation. So up here, I took the inverse sine. Of course, I have to take the inverse sine of both sides. So I've solved for theta, <clears throat> and theta is now the inverse sine of negative one half. Now, in words, when you have something like this, first of all, as we're beginning to work with these inverse trig functions, whenever you have an inverse trig function, always just say to yourself, that this whole thing has to equal an angle. And it makes sense here because we're saying theta is this. But later on, you're just going to be going to be given some inverse trig functions. And if you start to get a little confused, just say to yourself, wait a second, an inverse trig function is always an angle. Now, in terms of words, what we say is for what angle will the sign equal negative one half? It's the same question we ask when we solved it this way. We ask ourselves, let's go find an angle where the sign is negative one half. Same question here. But, now here's the big difference, and I'm not going to take the time to explain it. It has to do with the definition of functions and one-to-one -one functions and just some rules about math. But what's going to happen is, for this inverse trig function, I'm looking for an angle here, but when I actually use the inverse sine, my possible answers are limited. In this case, the answer is an angle. And because I'm going to use the inverse sine, just the way this is in the math world, my, only, my solution has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Let's think about that. We don't work with negative angles a lot. We go back to our unit circle. We know pi over 2 is here. Negative pi over 2 is down here. As a positive angle, you can think of negative pi over 2 as 3 pi over 2. But for this inverse sine function, they like to use negative pi over 2. So basically, I'm looking for an angle, and it's going to have to come from someplace over here. So what I do is I say, okay, that's fine. Let me go find an angle over here where the sign is negative one half. Now this is going to be one of our special angles, and it's negative one half is actually, let me do it again. There's our three special angles. Actually right here, Right. So therefore, the sine is negative one half. Now think about this. This is like a negative angle. So right here, it's actually going to be negative pi over six. You notice there's only one answer. It is true. That over here, the sign is also negative one half, but you know what? This angle is not in my allowed region. <clears throat> 
So that's one of the big keys for inverse trig functions. There's a limitation of where your angle can be. That's just another. How about if you were asked to find the inverse sine the inverse sine of square root of 3 over 2. So what you do is, once again, you go to the inner circle and you go looking for an angle where the sine is square root of 3 over 2. But you've got to make sure the only possible answers have to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So you say, where, what's the angle where the sine of square 3 over 2? And you realize it's right here, which is pi over 3. And just to make it very clear, if I had given you a different problem, and if I had given you the problem where I said, Here's the sine of theta square root of 3 over 2. Solve this, find theta. And I had to find theta between 0 and 2 pi. If I solve this without in any way using the inverse trig function, then I would actually give both angles, pi over 3 and 2 pi over 3. So if I'm just solving an equation, I'm not using inverse trig functions, I can give all the angles. But as soon as I start using an inverse trig function, or if I'm given an inverse trig function, my answer is restricted to only certain angles. All right, that's one of the big things about inverse trig functions. Now, on top of all that, it gets a little more confusing because if we think about inverse cosine functions, so for instance, how about we're ask, how about inverse cosine of um, basically we're trying to find inverse cosine of square root of 2 over 2. That's because inverse cosine, it's going to be restricted. But what's interesting, for both inverse sine and inverse tangent, when you're finding those angles, the angles have to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, sort of like the right half of the unit circle. But with inverse trig functions, just to make life more interesting, for inverse cosine, you know what the range of possible answers are, angles? It's 0 to pi. Now, on the one hand, it's a little bit simpler because we're not having to deal with any negative angles like with inverse sine, inverse tangent. But just the strange thing is that these are not the same. Inverse sine, inverse tangent, the possible angles are negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Or inverse cosine, it's 0 to pi. So with that in mind, I go back up here and I ask myself, OK, let's go find an angle somewhere between 0 and pi. That means you take the cosine at square root of 2 over 2. Think back to unit circle. It's going to be pi over 4, right? So you go ahead. And just to reiterate it over here, I'll do it again. If, if this was a problem you were given and you were asked, To solve this, all angles between 0 and 2 pi, because I'm not going to use any kind of inverse cosine function, 
I would say pi over 4, 7 pi over 4. But as soon as I turn it into an inverse cosine problem, I'm restricted to pi over 4. Now here's an inter another interesting thing to think about that becomes it's going to become important later on. Let's think about inverse trig functions. Let's just say um, for now, let me just call this x. Is there a limitation on what I can take the inverse trig function of? This can be a little confusing. I think the easiest way is just let me do some examples, and then you're going to see what's going to happen. Let me just do a bunch of inverse trig problems. How about... What is the inverse sine of 1 half? Okay, once again, inverse trig function, this thing is going to be an angle. So for what angle is the inverse sine 1 half? And of course, I have my restriction, negative power of 2 and power over 2. And in this case, it's power over 6. How about the inverse sine of square root of 2 over 2? How about the inverse sine of negative 1? OK, so I'm asking myself. I need to go find an angle that when I take the sine of it, it's going to be negative 1. So if you think up here at the unit circle, where is the sine negative 1? Right here. What is that? That's negative pi over 2. Now just for fun, what if I said... What's the inverse sine of 2? So you're going to ask yourself the question. Let's go find an angle that when I take the sine, it's going to equal 2. Now hopefully, maybe you're a little confused because when you think about the unit circle, and of course, in this case, it's just half the unit circle, this is pi over 2, this is negative pi over 2, the angle, <clears throat> this is 0. But what is this actual, we know, the sine of this angle, there's the x and there's the y, and down here, so we know The maximum value of the sine is 1, right? Sine of 0 is 0. Sine of pi over 2, this is the, the highest we ever get on the unit circle. So we know the sine pi over 2 equals 1. And the lowest we get is down here, the sine of negative power over 2 is negative 1. But back to our problem, we're saying, let's go find an angle where the sine is 2. Well, you know what? The sine is never 2. The sine goes from negative 1 to 1. It's no solution. For an inverse sine function, x must be between negative 1 and 1. And it's the same thing with the inverse cosine function. I could write it this way. x has to be between negative 1 and 1. If at any point you try and take an inverse sine or inverse cosine function, 
and the values not between negative one and one, it's no solution. Now here, just to make life interesting, what about inverse tangent? Actually, inverse tangent, x can be anything, just to make life interesting. So, let me just quickly, just to reinforce this, let's just do a few more inverse trig problems. Make sure I haven't repeated any of these, which I may have. Inverse sine function of negative square root of 3 over 2. So I'm looking for an angle where the sine is negative square root of 3 over 2. Of course, I'm restricted. So it's got to be this angle right here. And that angle is negative pi over 3. about the inverse cosine of one. So my unit circle over here is just the top half. So for what angle is the cosine one? I know the cosine is one right here. So the angle zero. about the inverse cosine of negative square root of 3 over 2. I'm looking for an angle where the cosine is negative square root of 3 over 2, which I think is right here, because it's I'm limited to the top half of the unit circle. And that right there is 5 pi over 6. And find the last one. Let's find the inverse sine function of negative 3 halves. So here's my sine up here. So I say, okay, let's go find an angle where the sine is negative 3 halves or like negative 1.5. And then you realize the sign down here is negative 1, and you realize there's no angle where the sign is negative 3 halves, so negative 1.5. So this is one where, remember, this has to be between negative 1 to 1. This is outside this range here. So we just say there's no solution. All right, so that's inverse trig functions. Now we'll do another video on some other aspects of inverse trig functions.